Now, one of the first tasks of that new government was to conduct a thorough strategic defence review. Uh, the reason that they undertook that was that the last defence review that we undertook was in 1998. And in the 12 intervening years, our aspirations as a country and the resources that we were willing to put into defence had parted company in all reality. Uh, there is no doubt that we recognise, because of the very severe economic climate that we were operating in, that the implications of our defence review were that we would probably end up with a smaller military. Um, but it was better to be a smaller military rather than a larger military which was continually struggling to balance its books. And as a result of that, was very significantly under-resourced. Um, now, the Strategic Defence Review started with uh, a very good intent, which was to make sure that it was an intellectually robust piece of work that genuinely tried to match the size and shape of our armed forces to our future foreign and security policy. But also it recognised the very serious nature of our economic circumstances as well. And that resources were going to be, we're going to have to pay a very significant part in anything that we actually did in the future. And in particular, there was a focus on the air sector because of the high cost of many of our air and space programmes as well. Hence, the title of my presentation, air and space power, an expensive luxury. Because there were some parts of the defence community, and indeed the academic community, who were saying, is this something that we can maintain as a nation for the future? The range of capabilities that we had enjoyed in the past and have given us the ability to conduct a very wide range of operations um, over the recent years. Now, not surprisingly, um, I do not agree with the statement that air power is an expensive luxury. And indeed, if you look at what we have, the operations that we've conducted over recent years, air power has been an absolutely essential, not only enabling capability, but delivers capability in its own right. That does not mean that there are not things that we as a community, both the military and an industrial community, should not be trying to address in terms of particularly the cost base, both procurement and long-term sustainment of our platforms and our systems. But there is also another issue which I think flowed out of our defence review, and that is a view and a lack of understanding in people, some people's minds as to the utility of air power and how air power capabilities are actually used, particularly in enabling and supporting joint campaigns and the type of campaigns that we've been conducting in recent years. And as I said, there is not a part of the Royal Air Force front line, the current front line, which is not being used in one shape or form in Afghanistan today from our fast jets, transport, rotary wing, force protection, intelligence gathering, you name it, it is being used in one shape or form, and many parts of the front line being significantly overstretched. Now the good thing out of the strategic defence review was that there was a conclusion that the UK should maintain what we are calling an adaptive posture. And what that means is that we retain the ability to operate across the spectrum of operations from top-end warfighting through counterinsurgency warfare to the more benign end of the spectrum, humanitarian operations, should they be required. And that we also have a global ability to intervene should we need to intervene as part of a coalition. I say that because there was an element of the defence and academic community in the UK who advocated and espoused that the character of future warfare was going to be characterised by what we were doing in Iraq and Afghanistan, counterinsurgency. And that is how we should reconfigure our armed forces 
to be able to undertake that type of operation. Now, I would contend that in reality, many of the capabilities that we are using in our counterinsurgency operations are exactly the sort of sophisticated capabilities that you need to conduct high-end uh, conventional operations. And that is the nature of the sophisticated type of operations that we are having to, be, having to conduct to defeat the insurgencies that we are experiencing, particularly in Afghanistan. And indeed, the aim of recent years in the UK Armed Forces, and particularly the Air Force, has been to ensure that the capabilities that we have are as flexible and as adaptable as possible so that they do have utility across the spectrum of operations. Uh, and that improves both operational effectiveness, but it also improves logistic sustainment and, of course, reduces cost as well. Now one of the particularly good pieces of work which I believe came out of the Strategic and Defence Review was the piece of analysis which was conducted on the future character of warfare. And what that concluded was that we live in an unpredictable world. But it also concluded that the future battle space could be characterised by those particular <coughs> words. That they were, it was going to be congested that we were frequently going to have to operate in an, invert, an, an urban environment, that it was going to be cluttered. And what do I mean by cluttered? That the enemy will be, up, be able to hide amongst the people. A very ambiguous environment. That it would be connected. That we would use networks, the internet, the enemy would use exactly the sort of same capabilities that we would be constrained by a very tight rules of engagement, we would have to operate under the scrutiny of the media, an increasingly intrusive media. And that it would be contested as well, that the enemy would use asymmetric threats as well as symmetric threats to contest, contest every one of the environments. Now, I think the, the statement which really sums it up more than anything for me is that one, which is an extract from the document. No matter how clearly one thinks, it's impossible to anticipate with any certainty the character of future conflict. So maintaining a balanced force structure which can adapt and can operate across the spectrum of um, conflict is important. Now, as I said, the Defence Review concluded that we should maintain a balanced and adaptive force structure now, what does that mean for air power? Well, what it meant for us was that the major capability areas of air and space control, air mobility, precision attack, and situational understanding, intelligence and surveillance, um, were all key parts of the capabilities that we would need to retain for the future. But it also highlighted the growing threat that we face from cyber attack and the importance of cyber security. It emphasised the trend towards UAVs. And it also highlighted that we had to somehow drive out more cost from the, the defence base, both in, in procurement and sustainment. And when I was preparing this talk, I thought, OK, well, that's very interesting. Um, but what, it, what is the relevance to the audience I'm going to be speaking to in India? And I think that it is uh, relevant. I say that because although our situations are very different, the size and shape of our armed forces are very different, I think the type of capabilities that we require are similar. We both have the need to be able to conduct conventional high-intensity operations because of state-on-state -state conflict. We need to be able to con conduct counterinsurgency operations and the, the more benign type of operations as well. And what I'd like to do is now pick up really on some of the trends that I believe flow out of that. And the first one is the importance of gaining and maintaining 
control of the air. And I've said this in the past, and, and I will continue to reiterate it, because it is such an important aspect of joint operations. What it provides is complete freedom of manoeuvre for the other environments, for the Army and the Navy to conduct the plan without any threat of uh, attack, interference from the air. I say that because although it came out of the defence review that we may need to maintain that capability, there is still a lack of understanding of what it really means. And our operations over recent years in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have enjoyed complete freedom of manoeuvre. The air environment is benign, so we have been able to operate completely uh, with complete freedom, things like UAVs, which I'll come on to in a second. So it's very easy to dismiss and also uh, not understand how challenging it can be against a sophisticated range of threats, which are only increasing in the future, how challenging it is to achieve air supremacy and control of our airspace and our space uh, further afield. So the UK, uh, the way that we are transforming our force structure uh, also undertook a significant amount of debate as well. How do we transform our legacy fleets of tornadoes and harriers uh, into the force structure which is going to exist in 2020, which will only be based on our Typhoon Force and Joint Strike Fighter, which will give us the stealthy advanced air-to-air -air and air-to-ground capability that we believe that we need to take on the range of threats that we're likely to face in the future. My second theme is advanced weapons. And this has really been born out of our experience in Afghanistan, where the rules of engagement that we are having to exist within and the scrutiny that we are continually under to maintain the absolute minimum of collateral damage has placed an emphasis on precision guidance in every respect and has driven the procurement in particular of two weapon systems, two of which you see on the slide, which is paved way four, a 500 class, 500 pound class precision guided GPS and laser guided weapon with a variety of advanced features within it and also dual mode brimstone, which gives us a very discreet small warhead, particularly against mobile targets, which we've never had in the past. What I would like to show you, though, is also a, a video which demonstrates the difficulty of genuinely integrating joint fires. So the integration of uh, fires from the ground and fires from airborne platforms as well. And this is video from Afghanistan and it shows an incident where we have a, a Taliban identified um, encampment which in amongst the village and we have available a harrier sitting over this particular target and we also have the ability to use indirect army fire. And the decision was made to use indirect fire first before using a 500 pound class air delivered weapon so that there could be a graduated response. And I hope what this will do is demonstrate what we now are able to deliver from uh, the air and the implications of integrating joint fire. So you'll first of all see indirect fire from 105 light guns. And you can see that the weapons are distributed quite a lot around the actual target. This is now the delivery of a paveway 4 on the actual target. The reason I show this is because it highlights two particular issues. First of all, the difficulty of truly integrating uh, joint fires. It also demonstrates an educational issue of how do you educate um, army colleagues on how to use the weapon systems which are available most effectively and it also demonstrates 
the sort of accuracies that we can now achieve with precision-guided air weapons.